a peek at the big ear telescope makes a researcher scribble wow in the margins on a printout. A big firefight lasts for hours in Los Angeles, but are the targets really from this earth? A farmer finds the breeze on his land. According to some, this is the start of the largest cover-up in US history. Welcome to Digging Up Ancient Aliens. This is the podcast where we examine the TV show Ancient Aliens. Do their claims hold water to an archaeologist or are there better explanations out there? I'm your host, Frederick, and this is episode 9. And today we have something special prepared for all of you. Today we will break down episode 5 and this is the season finale. And for that we have a very special guest with us today. But before that, remember that sources, resources and reading suggestions are attached to the show notes and you can find them also on our website, diggingupancientaliens.com. There you can also find contact info if you notice any mistakes or have any suggestions. And if you do like the podcast, I would really appreciate if you left one of those fancy five-star reviews that I've heard so much about. I will, of course, thank you by name in the next episode. But enough of me jammering. I want to welcome our guest Blake Smith from Monster Talk and In Research of to the podcast. Thank you for having me. You're much welcome. Uh, Blake, have you had any previous encounters with ancient aliens? I know that you have talked a little bit about it in the past on Monster Talk at least. Yeah, I, we, it's, it's one of those topics we don't talk about on Monster Talk a lot because... It is, well, it is, I guess if aliens are monsters, it's monster adjacent, but uh, it's, it comes up a lot on my other podcast in research of, because so much of that's tied to the birth of uh, the, we, that's a show where we watched the television show in search of, which was a paranormal show. It's one of the earliest uh, of these type shows in the 1970s uh, hosted by Leonard hmm. Nimoy. And that show literally has a direct lineage with Von Daniken. So it was produced through um, Alan Landsberg, who was fascinated with uh, the Von Daniken books. And he had Rod Serling come in and narrate uh, an American version of the uh, original Chariots of the Gods documentary. And then that led to several TV specials. And eventually they got the series together. But by then, Serling had uh, died of uh, surgery. He had, a, he had heart surgery and it didn't work out very well. Um, Hmm. Uh, well, I think anytime you die in surgery, that's not a great opt outcome. Uh, but uh, it, it ends up they go with uh, Leonard Nimoy, uh, Mr. Spock as the host. And so it became this incredibly influential bit of uh, 1970s in early 80s culture. And so hmm. much of it is about ancient aliens, uh, especially during the first season. It's just like every other episode has a wild and it's 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 not as bad as ancient aliens, but it is a crazy litany of talking about different sites and mysteries of the past without ever having hmm. a, a legitimate scientist to give context or any, you know, <laughs> historical or archaeological context that could explain this stuff. It just, it's just a big building, a mystery, some people that couldn't possibly have built this, you know, it's, it's over and over and over. So. But did you see a lot of uh, similarities between uh, In Search of and Ancient Aliens? Do they have the same pedigree or? They have a lot of the same DNA. I would say, obviously, uh, Ancient Aliens is slicker because it's got all these fancy computer graphics. And uh, I think Ancient Aliens is much more open about their agenda. Like that, you know exactly mm. what it is. In Search of sort of positions itself as being. A, a scientific inquiry into these mysteries and largely a lot of these episodes do include counter narratives so you get a scientist 
and a believer in these sort of fringe ideas and they hmm. both both are presented and, and and so that's nice but that sort of thing didn't really stick did it i think it became obvious that people really enjoy this is almost like if you don't mind my saying so it's sort of uh uh space alien pornography like it's just like if you'd like <laughs> ancient aliens this is you know it's all the good shots you know you know it's just, it's just <laughs> aliens did it you know so i it's it's much more up in your face with the ancient aliens and humans aren't capable of anything. And don't worry the aliens are watching. I, you know, what's interesting. I don't, I haven't seen a full spectrum of the shows, but they keep acting like the aliens are going to do one of two things. They're going to save us or they're going to destroy us. There's no kind of middle ground. And I, I don't know if they deal with, but the alien abduction stuff that I find uh, is an interesting phenomena. And I don't mean interesting. Mm-hmm. Like I think there really are, you know, abductions, but I think it's interesting the psychology of it and the way it ties into things like sleep paralysis and legends of uh, incubus and succubus, uh, that, that, that stuff is really interesting. But if you believe that aliens are visiting and also probing us and experimenting on us and making baby hybrids, that that's sinister, you know, <laughs> and it's not fun and they're not here just to help us stack rocks in pretty shapes, you know, so. Yeah, but they are quite sincere. You haven't seen the whole first season. First of all, you would have noticed how much better their video production has become on the CGI, the computer sure. uh, graphics. In the first episode, it looked like someone's 12-year-old <laughs> nephew had done it on their protest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, nice. <laughs> so it was it was horrible, but now it's evolved, so to say. You know, that might be, it might be that the first episode as a pilot was a proof of concept and then they got the budget for mm. the better stuff later maybe i'm just might guessing be. actually there one pilot that i haven't seen previously to uh, the series so it was a separate first episode but it will be a later thing but they even talk in i think it's episode three about how aliens created the human race as a slave race for mm. their gold mining because their atmosphere lacking gold as you need yeah they should just go to the pawn shop <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, but they would only got a bit of pocket lint and <laughs> 250. <Yeah. laughs> That's so bizarre. I mean, the universe is really big and I don't think you need to come to Earth to get gold. I, I'm pretty sure just the same <laughs> geology exists all over the universe. So, yeah. Yeah, but they... It's, it's a long ride. It's a long ride just to come get some shiny rocks, so... It's a very long run, but yeah, so they disproved uh, evolution previously in the episode. Oh, wow. Yeah, That's interesting. It was, yeah. of course, aliens that started the whole whole thing. Don't ask yeah. them where the aliens came from, but... <laughs> I shouldn't start off with a rant, but that's one of, that's, that's one of those things that really bothers me because it's... Uh, I'm a technology freak. I love, yeah. you know, innovations, and you don't get innovation without natural selection and i mean so it's the same principles there's there's selective forces at play in the invention of things right so you like something that happens in your head like you know i'm going to make a set of stairs or whatever it is you're building Mm. you you eliminate i'm not going to make this out of spaghetti so i'm not going to make this out of feathers you know you you eliminate a lot of things you don't even think about so there's all these things that just are never tried because you, in your head, you're trying things out and you go, that wouldn't work. That wouldn't work. That wouldn't yeah. work. So you try the things you think will work. And then when they don't, you innovate, you iterate, you iterate, you iterate. And eventually you get something that's great. And everybody's like, well, how could that be? How did you come up with it? Like, well, you did a lot of work. You did a lot of work. And our human ancestors did a lot of work. Um, one of the people in this episode is um, Bill Burns. And uh, mm. he, he teamed up with a guy named Corso at one point and wrote a book. I think it's called The Day After Roswell. And that is, to me, one of the most offensive books ever because there's a whole section where they imply that computer technology came from crashed aliens. And I'm like, no, no, it didn't. <laughs> there's a really beautiful, rich history, a very well publicized history of how we got to yeah. now. And it has nothing to do with crashed spaceships, it has everything to do with hard work, innovation, and collaboration. So, yeah, I mean, it's brrr. the same with the, <laughs> with the pyramids that they brought yes. up in the first episode. We have this evolution of pyramids, you know, from uh, the Asian ancient uh, sand bit burials to the mastabas to the step pyramids, and then yeah. a few couple failed attempts on up true pyramids, and then 
yeah, we have a pyramid because aliens would otherwise have traveled several thousands of years to get here and then failed to build a pyramid. Right, <laughs> right, exactly. Like the aliens didn't need to go through iterations, right? No. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> that's just, anyway, it's it's a ridiculous premise, but but, you know, we're not here to like just talk it down. I'm sure we're going to step through this episode and talk about interesting mistakes. <laughs> yeah. And let's open where they're, they are opening. So first they blast us with a few X-Files posters. There's it nines and asking us where um, all these alien movies come from. I'm a bit disappointed that they didn't have a Mars Attack poster. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, other than that, um, intro, well, mostly to catch your attention. And then they move into the, well, something they'd love to do. Pull up some old text and claim that something is in there somewhere. So this time they claim it's a Sanskrit text uh, that apparently referenced that there's 400,000 human-like creatures in the universe. And... I did some digging because, of course, they don't reference where they got it. They just exactly tell us, oh, it's a Sanskrit text. It's ancient. Trust us. You don't need to look this up. But from what I could find, it could be Padma Purana. And it has this passage in it. But it seems to... I'm not sure really what they want to prove with it because it's a religious text. Uh, exactly. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well... It- there's, there's just like in cryptozoology, like cryptozoology has a problem where it's kind of tied in with colonialism because people have beliefs in monsters. A lot of those beliefs are religious beliefs or spiritual beliefs. Mm-hmm. You know? And then people from other countries uh, in, you know, sort of the European American sort of style. Well, we're very science based. So I hear you, you think there's a monster, but obviously that's really an, a, a, it's an ape. Yeah. It's a, it's a kind of bear. It's a kind of lion, you know? So they're basically taking a spiritual idea and reducing it down to a natural explanation. Maybe there's nothing. Maybe it's not real at all. Maybe it's just a, a spirit, like a, a piece of folklore or religious mythology or something. So, you know, th- in this case, that I think that's a, uh, a Westerners coming in with their uh, ideas and taking these uh, Hindu texts or, or whatever religion it might be from another culture and then trying to say, aha, <laughs> you're talking about gods and mythology but really this is a you know this is a, a you know federation of space text this is like this is your primitive memory of working mm. with space people you know <laughs> and it's like okay no you know and they do that a lot you know there's also the you know sort of flying cities and nuclear bomb sort of interpretations oh and they do it to christian texts too i mean people think that um Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed by atomic weapons. You know, that's a really popular ancient alien idea. Yeah, so. yeah it was previously in the season. And um, you might not know this, but the Ark of the Covenant, that's a radioactive generator. It's a radio to God. Did you know that? <laughs> <laughs> I learned that in a documentary. Oh, like <laughs> yeah. You also have the mana machine from the Exodus. Yeah, yeah. That's that, so. So it's not God dropping food from the sky. No, it's a it was an alien machine. But the, uh, you know, primitive it was manufactured. people. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrible. Are puns okay? Are your audience going to be bothered by that? <laughs> uh, I think they will be just fine. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you can good, good, pun good, away. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't, as I said, I couldn't find the exact quote here. Uh, I could only find it on sites that seems to be related to Hare Krishna sects. So I'm not really completely sure about it but anyway it's iffy at best and then they do this thing that they tend to do in later episode at least that they start to talk about things that's actually quite interesting so they talk about drake and radio telescope and the start of setting yeah yes exactly you know it was interesting they 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 say you know Frank Drake built his own telescope Mm. and then they talk about it as though he invented radio astronomy in the 1960s. So like in 1960, he makes this uh, experiment, which was a very interesting experiment, right? Mm. But uh, radio astronomy actually started a long time before. And I don't remember the dates off the top. It's early 1930s. I remember there's a whole issue where scientists were looking for evidence 
of uh, sort of background radiation yeah. from this, you know, it, the, the Big Bang. And at the same time, telephone technology people were trying to figure out how to get rid of this weird static they were hearing on all their equipment. And they kept trying and trying. And they realized, oh, we're not going to get rid of this static. This is the static from the creation of the universe, yeah. right? And so the Nobel Prize ends up going to the Bell Labs people who were trying to clean up the system instead of the scientists who were literally <laughs> searching for this. It's a great story. But uh, yeah, the first radio telescope was actually built in 1937, a little bit after that. So it, once it was widely known that this was out there, then people understood mm. stars were emitting radiation and you could actually receive that information and do stuff with it. And, and boy, in the, you know, it's, no, it's been almost 100 years of radio telescope work and it's... Um, it's really transformed our understanding of the universe. Great science. Yeah. As I said, it's a um, part that they could have made a whole episode on and had a better outcome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they certainly could have. Um, they get this budget and they have these great, but this is, you know, they're telling a different kind of story, you know? Yeah. Uh, w uh, how's language on this? Like, uh, what, do you have any restrictions about what words we say? Is it? No, like, I'm not picky it there. You can... Uh, Okay, because a lot of this is bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> so I like to say bullshit when I see it. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of bullshit on here. So, but, but, you know, they kind of like it's bullshit decorated. Um, it's, it's, it's got points in it where they do some real science and then they hop right back mm. to the nonsense. And so that mixture, you know, if you eat a big spoonful of bullshit and science, you're still eating bullshit. You can't, <laughs> like, you can't just keep spitting out the bullshit and trying to swallow the science. So yeah, yeah and it's a tough. It's I think also a way to make it more credible because you have yes. these real things and then you mix it with the fantasy part, and the viewer will think that because of the real things, the fantasy part is more yes. reasonable uh, to be true to, uh, which of course is great for them but more work for <laughs> uh, yes. others to double check and something that made me a bit disappointed or not disappointed but maybe curious is why they left out so much about the wow signal yeah i would have thought that they would have focused in heavily on that really dig down because that's act an actual <laughs> mystery for scientists and aa theorists alike there. yes mm-hmm so, well, the WOW signal was picked up by uh, the Big Ear Telescope in Ohio yeah. State. Uh, yeah. But uh, now I forgot when it was, basically. Uh, Ooh, I, boy, I could, I'm sorry, quickly <laughs> check, but I think it was the early 1970s. Click, 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 got a very loud keyboard. 1977. Ah. So there, there you go. Yeah, so they basically got a... Um, peak in their signals back then they didn't really have computers as i understood it in this sort of way that we're used to so they printed out the signals and had to go through it by hand basically and some notice a spike just wrote, wrote wow and so far nobody has been able to really say what this is but we haven't been able to find it again after it but from the ancient aliens point of view, they could have really dug down there. Oh, scientists can't explain this. Yeah, it's a bit it's weird. A, it's a, yeah. It's, it is an interesting and legitimate mystery. Um, and, and unfortunately it's one of those things where it hasn't been reproduced hmm. and as a consequence, you know, what we, the word I think stochastic is a, a great word where it's just like, or it's something so random, you know, that you can't, you can't predict it. So, unless you're listening all the time and we're not because it takes money to listen. Mm. It takes money to run these, operate these systems, which is why the whole SETI program is funded largely by donations because nobody wants to pay to look. It's a great question. Everybody wonders, is there life out there in space, but nobody <laughs> wants to pay to find out, you know, and we've got, well, we've got people starving. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. But also, you know, we tend to type. We can care about more things. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's like, well, you know, also we tend to give all our money to 1% of the people and, you know, yeah. make sure that they have giant yachts <laughs> and, 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 
space program so they can go to Mars and, and New Zealand and all those places. I don't know. And it's it's I I, I don't I, I'm not going to get on a <laughs> anti-capitalist rant because I you know I live in a capitalist system and I'm dependent upon it and I'm very happy to have a job. But <laughs> I think there's enough money floating around that you could do pure science and pure research. Uh, and it's unfortunate that, that that's not something people care enough about. So everybody can find a reason to not spend mm. somebody else's money on something they don't care about, right? There's there's always that. Yeah, so. yeah but you could do both. Uh, there would be enough to go around. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I, I think if I think there's plenty of money, it's just not distributed very fairly. So. <laughs> <laughs> And this episode was also a bit special for me because we moved quite far. We moved from the telescopes to the golden disc, for example, and they talk Ooh, yeah. about the creation there. And I think it's a good 20 minutes before we get any weird things, to be honest. So the golden disc, it was a bit sad to see Sagan in this context. Yeah, I think you yeah. would have been a bit upset about this show. Well, you notice they didn't have any video, right? They just had stock footage of it, like stock photos, yeah. right? still photos. I think you can license still photography easier than you can get the family to allow you to use video. It's probably cheaper too, yeah. to use still photos. But I, I don't know if, if they had to ask his estate or like I think his wife's Andrianne, uh, Drian. Yeah, um, I don't think you know, she, she would and, have allowed I don't it. think she would have either. <laughs> <laughs> and and she and she worked very closely with him on the golden disc. I mean, like that was a project they worked on together. So mm. I, I I think um I think her absence here is maybe important. But yeah, you see Sagan here. Uh and I mean it's a I mean, man, I grew up in this age, so like it was such a big deal to, that they were sending out these space probes and then um you know, the idea there might be aliens and we're saying hello. And it's, it's kind of absurd. It's like throwing a single grain of sand <laughs> into the ocean and hoping some other person somewhere finds that grain of sand. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's crazy, but, but it also, if you don't try, you, you're never going to get anywhere. And we get data from it still, we still get data from it. Yeah, And, and then it, also a bit of publicity stunt i think people start about talk about space exploration and make it more interesting for the common uh, person in a sense and then we get the star trek the motion picture mm. uh which is all premised around the idea of one of these voyager craft coming back right yeah <laughs> improved <laughs> <laughs> Which brings us back to Leonard Nimoy because it all goes back to a search of. So. Of course. <laughs> so here we have the connection, basically. <laughs> yes, exactly. And something I learned here, because they talk about Chuck Berry being on the record, Johnny Be Good, yeah, that song. Yeah. And I've always had the impression that they wanted to have Beatles on the record yeah. because I heard it somewhere and never thought about checking up on the stories that they wanted to have Here Comes the Sun but couldn't obtain the rights because Beatles were busy in fighting about uh, getting the the rights to have it. Apparently that's a myth I learned. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. That is that is the first Beatles myth I've ever heard. <laughs> Was that- <laughs> So, now, did this happen after Paul was replaced by a double? What? <laughs> mm, maybe that's why he was replaced. <laughs> that could be it. it. It it's so I I it was so weird. I mean, it just seemed odd that they kept focusing on the fact that it had Chuck Berry, Johnny Be Good, but they didn't play any of that song. They just showed a picture of Chuck Berry and talked about it. I, I mean, there's so much on the disc, uh, you know, so many things. I love the, I love the thing that's about Bach, you know, yeah. that was interesting too. So, it, you know, and it's got instructions <laughs> and I, I love the solution they had. For, so some alien species finds this mm. and, and they want to figure out where did this come from? And so how can you know? And their clever solution was um, have a diagram that shows converging signals from pulsars that have different rates mm. so so something kind of like a morse code visualization yeah. that shows you the the rate at which the pulsars are, are in the pattern of the emissions of radiation and so by having all these convergent lines from different positions in space if someone were to do so they could kind of get a lot closer to finding our system our solar system by having this point of reference um and that's fascinating because it's tied directly to radio uh, astronomy 
because the discovery of the pulsar, which they also didn't hmm. talk about, is an absolutely <laughs> massive point because there was a really serious belief that maybe we had found an, an ancient civilization because we were seeing regular, repeated signals coming from another solar system. And it's like, whoa, what's going on here? What does this mean? And it was it took a while for them to realize it doesn't mean anything, but it's a scientifically <laughs> interesting thing that there's a kind of star called a pulsar that has a regular yeah. pattern of radio emissions. So as I said, they could have done a much more interesting episode with so much <laughs> truth in it. <laughs> yeah. it. In fact, I, I have to recommend uh, there's an interesting series that came on in um, I think it was 1980 uh, called uh, Cosmos also featuring yeah, Carl Sagan, yeah. only, only he talks. And it is, I think, eight episodes, but uh, ooh, it holds up so well. I rewatched it a few years ago. And I mean, obviously there's the new series with Neil deGrasse Tyson. <laughs> Nothing against Neil, but man, Sagan really takes you on a tour de force of everything about what we know about the universe and the cosmos. Uh, it's such a great introduction. And uh, thankfully my parents... Although I think they don't even believe in evolution, but they let me watch it. They watched one episode with me and then they bailed and I got to watch the rest by myself. And it's like me and Carl had some real bonding moments there and I appreciate it. So Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, I haven't, It was so good. I haven't seen that. I only read his uh, Demon Haunted World though. Yeah, which is another great book. Yeah. Really, really good. It's amazing. Yeah, but- uh, yeah. Something worth reading. But uh, to return to the golden disc here and... Sagan, we have Giorgio coming in and we start to get the first hint of it, it's going to get off the rails soon, but he's talking about the fact that there's Sumerian on the disc and sure it can. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, it's interesting because <laughs> as you know by now, the Sumerians were the first civilization they contacted and created. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so of course they wanted to put in, because Sagan was in on it, so they wanted to put in a Sumerian phrase so the aliens would i don't know remember us <laughs> i don't know <laughs> i yeah so, yeah exactly it's like oh those guys i remember those guys it's like it's like remember how they would like they wouldn't use our digital technology they only wanted to use clay tablets <laughs> it's so weird <laughs> yeah and and the, the whole part there is actually quite interesting have you read the murmurs of earth I have not. So that's a book written by the team behind the Golden Disc. So uh, I just started to read them, but I skipped to chapter four where Linda Salzman Sagan speaks about how they, well, decided on the different language and the creation of it. So basically they first wanted to have um, two languages, so the two biggest one and a dictionary to come with it. But they felt that that wasn't really democratic. So they decided to take the biggest 24 to start with and then fill up with as many as possible if they had time over. So they apparently set, started with the 24 and then set up telephone chains uh, trying to find the native speakers of different languages. So we have, for example, Swedish on the disk and a very Swedish nice. greeting. Hälsningar från en dataprogrammerare i den lilla universitetsstaden Ithaca på planeten jorden. So you could translate its greeting from a data, data programmer from the university town Ithaca on Earth. Except for wow. a piece of weather. Uh, it's a very Swedish greeting. We love to talk about what we work with <laughs> and where we live. <laughs> nice. Well, it's almost like you're all role-playing game characters. <laughs> it's like, I am John. I am the blacksmith. <laughs> Do you need to buy weapons? <laughs> oh, we have gotten better. But if you go back to 1920s, you still had people putting their work title on their gravestone. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Now that's a commitment <laughs> to a career. So you had uh, the Miller and then the name uh, or the shoemaker. And it doesn't mean, didn't mean, it wasn't just bankers or, you know, the top dogs. It was everyone in the society, Farmer Johnson. So yeah, you, you were very dedicated to your work. <laughs> wow. I do too many things. I don't know what I, my gravestone would have, my, then my name and then like 23 other things that I do. I don't, I don't know what I am. That's like, <laughs> do, does too much. <laughs> That's fantastic. Anyway, uh, Linda Sagan then moves on. And the reason why they have this ancient language, so they have, what is it? Five, four, Sumerian, Akkadian, Adanish, Lushulmu, Latin, 
Salvete qui cumque estis, bonam erga vos voluntatim abemus, et pacem per astra ferimus. High tight. Ashuli. In ancient Greek. Oitinis poteste chairete, aerenikos pros filos elelithamen filoi. And Linda, she says, quote, languages have import, uh, historic importance. They were taken down from the shelf, dusted off, and allowed to shine in their own right. So basically, they had time over and find someone who could speak it, and that's why it's on the disc. <laughs> that's fantastic. Yeah. So I, I think you can get an audio CD, uh, or well, <laughs> listen to me, <laughs> a CD. I think you can find online digital streaming versions of the Golden Disc. I believe that that, that that there's copies of the of the stuff that's on there that you can listen to. Yeah, I think you don't have to look far. I think Wikipedia even have all the recordings readily available. So if you want to look closer in it, and as I said, Murmurs of Earth, great read if you want to know more about the Golden Disc creation. Fantastic. From the Golden Disc, we move to the Kepler Telescope. And again, good documentary, I would say. It was, yes. I was actually very impressed. They did, they did a really lovely section here where they talk about how they use this uh, Kepler telescope to seek out exoplanets. Mm. That's not hugging, kissing planets. For, <laughs> that's a, it's a EXO, or it's the the idea of these planets outside of our solar system. And the way they do it is when those planets are rotating around their star. When the planet goes in front of the star, it slightly dims. It wouldn't be visible to us because it's, you know, that's not that much dimming, but we have very sensitive uh, equipment out there that can actually detect mm. that change. And if it has a periodicity to it that's, you know, reliable, then we know what we've got there is a planet orbiting the sun. And so I think when Kepler was a huge um, leap. Uh, in, in our ability to see these things. And the number of exoplanets that we know about now has increased dramatically and boy it's all about to change isn't it so i'm very excited because over the christmas break we got the uh, the new telescope the james webb telescope which is just an astonishing piece of technology and and i'm hmm. looking forward to seeing what what it actually is able to detect and i'm hoping with all my heart that it doesn't <laughs> fail here at the last minute because it's overcome so many amazing well, it's got to do this. It's got to unfold. It's got to be packed. It's yeah. like origami. It's this amazing, big, <laughs> giant set of lenses that have to go out and like go in. And it's, it's our, I think it's the first thing we've ever put into a Lagrange point. So mm. it's, it's in its own stationary location, uh, you know, a million miles from Earth, but, you know, um, being towed around by the sun. So, but they're yeah. not afraid to uh, hit the UFO that hides in the Lagrange zones. That's a good point, you know. Maybe that's what it's really there for. So. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, but they even talk about the telescope in uh, the episode. Oh, I missed it. So Yeah, but yeah, I didn't hear they were talking about that. But that's, that's like uh, John the Baptist saying, I'm just the prophet <laughs> telling you about the Jesus that's to come, you know. <laughs> so. Yeah, they, they didn't they dig into it. They just briefly mention it, as I remember. But again, they... This good science, uh, or they talk about the Goldilocks zone and where we would find life in the universe and how we use microbial math, for example, to find signs in uh, of life in different uh, places. And then they start to go off the rails because, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you changed the names there. I'm not sure what happened, but we have George Nuri exactly. from Coast yep. to Coast AM who wonders what would happen to us if we met another civilization that has five or ten billions head start to find us yeah i i don't know what to make of that the, you know I, I think there i think people don't understand evolution very well you know a civilization may last you know thousands of years maybe but a species won't last millions of years it'll be different over over that amount of time like it literally goes through biological changes. I, I, it wouldn't even be the same animal anymore. Yeah. Right. So I, I don't know why everybody's hooked on this idea of like, you know, these species have 10 billion years of extra, you know, or, you know, whatever crazy number of time to develop technology. Um, it's like, well, no, no, probably not. I mean, things right. I, you know, we don't know what the culture of these others, you know, creatures might be mm. if they exist. And I don't, as let me say, I'm very skeptical about the idea that aliens are visiting us, but I'm absolutely open and 
would be shocked if there's not other intelligent life in the universe. But the universe is really big, and I don't know if we'll ever meet these guys, you know. So yeah, and that's, or if we did, what would they be like? I don't know, but you know, yeah, that's something they bring up in I'm not sure in this episode, but at least in later, that scientists believe in alien life. But well, there's a difference between believing that in an infinite universe with an infinite planets that there might be another intelligent species compared to. The intelligent species have visited us to give us levitation guns to build pyramids. That's a bit of a difference. Exactly. This, this yeah. is like the, the thing they used to say when I was in high school is like, you know, you're one in a million. It's like, yeah, okay, great. It's like, which means there's thousands of you over over the world. I mean, there's lots and lots of you. You know, it's like <laughs> pure statistically, yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, and then we come into War of the World broadcast. So they, they dip their toes in crazy, but then they switch to not sure why they put this in, because there was other things they could have talked a bit more about. Well, the, the idea I think they were trying to say was when the War of the Worlds broadcast happened in 1938, there's this story that what happened was people went nuts because the way the, the, the episode was presented, yeah. it, was a, it was a dramatization. Yeah. It was presented over the radio. And if you didn't catch the beginning of it, you would assume you were listening to a live news broadcast and that everybody trusted the veracity and, you know, that radio was a factual medium. Mm. And so when they tune in and they hear this broadcast, which is designed to sound like a normal broadcast being interrupted, that people panicked and went crazy and thought the world was coming to an end and picked up <laughs> weapons, and, you know. But the, but But the truth is a little bit more complicated that there was this broadcast. I've listened to it. It's actually extremely well mm. done. Um but it is clearly a drama. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's not mysterious. And they do tell you during the broadcast that it is a dramatization. <laughs> you know, it does have ending credit. I mean, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's clearly <laughs> fictional. And also what happened was this was at the time when the newspapers were, were really struggling to compete with radio. Yeah. Pe- people were really like getting to people now may sit around and watch their tablets or their screens, <laughs> but there was a window of time when people as a family would come together and watch TV. And before that, there was a time when they would come together and listen to the radio, mm. little orphan, Annie, the shadow, there's all these shows they would listen to. And so the, the newspapers were struggling to keep up and try to keep their revenue streams. Mm. And so they kind of blew out of proportion how bad the panic was around this radio broadcast. And they, what they wanted was to kind of rein in the power of radio so that it couldn't do stuff like this or to discredit it. Like, mm. you can't trust radio. Look what they do. And so it, it was kind of a moral panic. And uh, I think that's become the folklore. But I want to push back against that. I, there's a book by Robert Bartholomew and Ben Radford uh, called, um, what is it called? Hold on a second lost the title the martians have landed uh and it's a history of media driven panics and it is a great really metic bartholomew is such a great researcher he did Hmm. very meticulous explanation of all this so i'd say look that up so yeah it sounds interesting and from what i could gather it seems as hd wells might have also written on the fact that the papers picked up on it and then use it as a stepping stone to land better gigs you know see what i could do with just radio imagine what i could <laughs> do with um television or uh, movies oh the, the or- orson welles ah, yes, yes yes yeah. yes yeah, yeah yeah no no it's i do that all the time because it's orson welles <laughs> adapting hg wells exactly so uh and i think in fact hg wells should have still been alive i think he lived i think he lived into the start of world war Two or right before it but but uh but yeah it, it's uh orson you know, became kind of an auteur, yeah. you know, where he go out and become, a, you know, make his own movies and everything else. But from the panic of the worlds, we we dive deeper and we go to Battle of Los Angeles. Were you familiar with this event previously? Boy, or? am I. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, not only am I familiar with it historically, but I also watched the uh, movie from a few years ago with Aaron Eckhart, I think is, um, uh, w- but uh, it was like a, there was a combat no, no, it's real aliens kind of thing <laughs> happening. So, but no, it, that one was set in modern times. But basically, I think it was called Battle LA, but it's the same idea. Yeah, I think I saw that movie too, but I think I've forgotten it in self defense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was, 
you know, I would give it like a C plus. It was, it, it did exactly what it said on the package and no more, no less. It was people fighting in Los Angeles against aliens. That's what it was. So yeah. It's, it's, anyway, they, this is, this is a great skeptical story. Like if you're a skeptic about mm-hmm. like people's perceptions, it's a story about we're at war with Japan and America was already uptight because we'd been surprise attacked at Pearl Harbor. Yeah. And so everybody was afraid that the Japanese fleet was going to come up and, uh, you know, do an all out attack on coastal cities. And um, I, I don't think it was widely known that Japan's whole deal with Pearl Harbor was to try to keep us out of the war, mm. right? That it was a very strategic thing of if we destroy their ships, then the, the Pacific fleet will be gone. They won't have anything to bring over, you know, the, ta-da! Yeah, they you will know, leave America's us out alone. of the war. Yeah. Right, and that's, but what it did was it, it scared, you know, they call it awakening the sleeping giant, but <laughs> it really terrified Americans. And so um, they had set up batteries to fight, you know, like basically everybody was set up for a coastal war mm. and psychologically prepared for a coastal war. So when the air raid sirens started going off, you know, everybody started shooting and the boom, it's, it's, it, it, people saw things. There were lights. If you see this newspaper photo of they've, that's a touched up photo that they've got there where it looks like there's a big ship in the middle, but it, it's uh, that it's clearly people were seeing something. You don't have that many things exploding in the air and firing yeah. and lights and sirens. Well, they wouldn't be doing that if there was nothing there is a certainly reasonable thing to think, you know, but the reality is, you, yeah, they can. People start shooting when there's a panic. I mean, this happens, you know, <laughs> it happens all the time. So I, I don't think there needs to be spaceships or incoming airplanes for people to just empty their guns, you know. So. No, and what surprised me a little bit was that they brought up the bombing of uh, Pearl Harbor. Because, as you say, I think that would be... Uh, uh, argument against it being uh, or uh, you know that it could yeah. have been because yeah they say they were on edge of course they were their soldiers there was a huge <laughs> uh, well uh, bombing uh, on the navy uh, attack of course they're nervous and someone sees something start shooting the air siren goes off and <laughs> well it, it throughout this episode the word or the the letters UFO are used to mean multiple things. Mm. And this is one of the struggles, I think, linguistically around talking about this topic. I'm a skeptical person. You know, I don't believe we're being visited by aliens. But in the literal meaning of UFO as unidentified flying object, I have, of course, there's UFOs, right? Yeah. We, we, we see things we don't understand all the time. I mean, that's, yes, absolutely. <laughs> if you don't know what something is and it's flying, Ta-da! You saw a UFO, but but they also have UFOs meaning intelligently run alien craft or mm. you know you know something from another planet. And many, most people probably associate UFO with aliens, not with unidentified. The unidentified word means nothing, yeah. but UFO has so much cultural baggage with it right now. I think that's why they're switching to a tip and all these other different. No, that's no, no. UAPs. Sorry. UAPs. Sorry. Unidentified aerial phenomena. It was like, yeah, but, or or what I like to think, uh, was it WTF WTs or what the fuck was that? (laughs) That looks like, (laughs) yeah, that should catch on. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Simple is better usually. Yes, exactly. But yeah, I think the word UFO need to go in some sense because it doesn't mean what it are supposed to mean any longer, which make it And they hop all around historically in this episode. <laughs> so, you know, they they you know, they they're going to go and talk about other technologies and then go back and forward and back. Mm. But I didn't hear anybody talking about Kenneth Arnold in here. Did you? Mm, I'm not really familiar it, with Kenneth Arnold. You are, I bet. You just, he's the guy who first saw flying saucers, like it coined the term flying saucers. So he was flying an airplane in Washington state and saw a, a formation of craft mm. that were actually sort of um, boomerang shaped. And he said that they were skipping or they're flying through the air, bouncing like like saucers skipped on the surface of a lake. And that became the origin mm-hmm. of the idea of flying saucers. So what he saw was crescent shaped, 
But because he used the term flying saucer, it became what people were looking for. They were looking for discs. Yeah. And then very soon after that, in the same year, you get the Roswell crash and everybody had been looking up in the air for flying discs. And so when they found this wreckage, they say, oh, it's a flying disc. And then, of course, they have to recant, which we'll get to. I don't want to take it out of sequence. But but yeah, uh, Kenneth Arnold is not mentioned. The, init the initial flying saucer sighting is not mentioned yet so much depends on that story and the context it came out of. So, mm, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, when you say it, I think I heard a story, but yeah, not a name, so. Yeah, it's a good, it's it's a, I would say, if you want to study this stuff, it is like one of the most important cases. Mm. Uh, and, and I don't mean it because, oh, maybe it's real. What I mean <laughs> is because it is the ground zero for when everybody started looking for aliens, right? Yeah. Like it really is. That's That's the point. Because what he described couldn't be accounted for by earthly aircraft if the things he described were accurate to what was really happening. Mm. It's to me, it's identical to what's happening right now with the UAP and the government because you can misunderstand aerial phenomena yeah. so easily. The equipment can give you bad information. Your eyes can give you bad information. Your brain can give you bad information. There's at least three big vectors right there where things can be misunderstood. Mm -hmm. And so you combine that with our uh, sort of limited power of language and uh, how we have to share our ideas with other people who all have their own belief systems and bias <laughs> and psychology. It becomes really complicated to get 100% accuracy about anything when we're talking. So um, it's really important. So Kenneth Arnold in that first sighting is really, really important culturally because it's where we get flying saucers from. Yeah, that's really cool in a sense. Something that struck me here was that they actually had cameras on site. Oh yeah, yeah. Didn't that look cool? Yeah. I mean, I was, I was I was really surprised. I I didn't expect that. I was like, oh look, they're doing a reenactment. Yeah. But you you did some work on this. You, it's not quite what it seems, is it? No, it's or is that right? It's real. I thought they had you know paid people to reenact for camera as part of the production. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, like actors. Yeah, right. but yeah. then they actually show later in the episode that this is a yearly thing, just like you. Americans like to do, I don't know, civil war. Civil war battles. <laughs> I, I live in the South and like, yeah, I have neighbors who, I had neighbors who up until recently had a, a real civil war cannon. Oh. Like, I mean, not a, a re, it was a real cannon. It was not historically from the civil war, but they, they took their cannon out and did reenactment. So we took it out to my grandfather's farm and shot a bunch of stuff. It was really cool. So, I mean, it, they only would shoot the uh, powder rounds. Yeah. They wouldn't actually put a cannonball in it. Because they're cowards. Okay. So I, so it's that kind of thinking. Anyway, whatever. I really wanted to, I wanted to blow some stuff up. So I was very excited about it. It's like, you know, no target practicing or watermelons or no, but it, it made a lot of noise and smoke, though. It scared the cows real bad. So it, it was a lot of fun. I can imagine. We don't have much of them in Sweden. We do have one where we reenact a battle in, on Gotland between the Danish and the Swedish forces. The only reenactment I can think about, but that's medieval, so no cannons or... I, we have a thing here called the Society for the Creative Anachronism, which is a medieval reenactment uh, uh, club. And uh, they dress up in armor and they have uh, big battles. They're, they're not historically accurate because everybody uses... <laughs> Uh, wooden swords, <laughs> but it is really fun to dress up and, you know, run at each other screaming. Yeah. And, you know, it's just like when you're a kid, you're playing, you're dead. No, no, you're dead. <laughs> like, so, <laughs> there's a whole lot of that going on. So. Yeah, it can escalate quite quickly. But it, yeah, it was good footage, though. I mean, they, they then, you know, they bring in people. Well, I guess we shouldn't. They show the, the battle first, and then they, later on they bring in the people who actually saw it, right? This isn't all together, right? No, they so was, mixed up the yeah, little bit. Yeah. Yeah, so we meet uh, Littleton. He has been part of the series until now. And he is one of those th people that you that show you that intelligent people can believe stupid things too. Um, <laughs> but he um, apparently was an eyewitness, and he claims to have seen UFO as the shelling continued. And in a sense, there is a UFO, <laughs> in the sense that they thought they saw things, 
and they were in the air and they couldn't identify yeah, them. So it's but but he doesn't mean that. He means alien yeah. craft, alien technology. <laughs> he means that there was an alien spacecraft and not the definition of the word. And that kind of implies the aliens are kind of dumb because they're just sitting there letting everybody shoot at them. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know. That seems until they crash, like, even no, apparently, n- not even going to move away, <laughs> not going to hide, like you know, nothing like that. You know, possibly they're going to get shot and crash. Yeah, I uh, did uh, uh, earlier uh, in the season <laughs> they, you know, spread the seas and uh, nuked a couple of um, clay built towns. Uh, but well, getting fired on, no. And little Tony also used this um, argument from authority. Even he says, "Quote: I say this is a scholar." And then he said that the most efficient explanation is that we to, is today we call an UFO, something out of this world, something belonging to another technology. Okay, sure, he's a PhD in anthropology, so I don't really know how that makes him an expert in something he saw as a kid in the sky. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's a stretch. <laughs> <laughs> So what this, um, this, the gods of Eden book that's coming up is, did you, have you read that or looked at that at all? I don't know what that book's about. No, I haven't really got around to it. They just bring it up in the episode and then uh, we don't really hear anything on it. I mean, anytime you see the gods of, and then anything to do with ancient technology, you know, it's Von Daniken adjacent or, you know, uh, in that generation of, of ancient alien stuff. So. Yeah. yeah, but basically Gods of Eden is um, William Bramley's attempt to, I don't know, explain weird things with more weird things. So everything <laughs> from ancient pharaohs to the assassination, assassination of JFK can be uh, attributed to E.T., basically. But they b- yeah. bring it up and then they basically just... Fizzle out. I think they use it to get to the Foo Fighters. Yes. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> Which is, I mean, w- well, I wanted to say something, though, because Bill Burns comes on at one point and says that, uh, you know, the more you have war, the more you're going to have <laughs> UFOs. It, like, like, like they're watching us, like, you know, pay-per-view or something. I don't know. They're, they're not interfering, but, like, they're going to show up and see what's going on, you know. So it's very peculiar, though, because I think... If UFOs are things you don't know what they are and they're in the sky yeah. and you're in a war zone, more people are going to be looking to the air to see if there's, you know, it, to see if there's an attack coming or whatever. In the, in the age of aircraft, mm. you know, you didn't see more and more UFOs during medieval times because we didn't have airplanes. <laughs> you know, we, there was no reason to be looking into the sky. But as soon as we got literally as, as started using balloons in warfare, it became important to keep an eye on the skies. It really did. Yeah. And so I think it's absolutely natural that if like statistically, you're going to have more sightings of unidentified things if you've got more people looking to the sky with, you know, anticipation of seeing things. Mm. So I, I, I really think it's that's a really dumb argument he's making there. But whatever yeah. but I, I did, and then we talk about bogeys coming in and we get into food fighters i, I yeah that did, 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 do you want to talk about food fighters you want me to talk about food fighters or no you can talk about food fighters yeah so in world war ii largely over europe is where i'm most familiar with the stories but uh people go on these long bombing runs and they're going to be dropping mm. bombs over germany and uh german controlled territory they started seeing glowing lights around the plane following them um and to me you know skeptically i it seems like this is more akin to things like saint elmo's fire where you see Mm. uh you're flying in a very statically charged but nowhere to dissipate it kind of uh craft yeah and and so uh i think having these sort of phenomena is not that shocking and the fact that they're probably electromagnetic phenomenon if that they the foo fighters affected the plane's equipment i'm like yeah i could see that it makes perfect sense you know they probably didn't affect ancient wooden sailing ships because they didn't have any equipment <laughs> of, of that that would be affected by that sort of thing yeah. but but if you've got a plane that's got electrical and electromagnetic equipment and you've got weird static energy discharges going mm. off yeah i could see how that could affect equipment so i don't think that's a stretch I just, I, I would love to know more about it, you know, but it's, um, 
it's not the kind of thing that we can easily afford to recreate. We can't send, you know, <laughs> propeller bombers over, you know, European cities just to see about this Foo Fighter thing. It's so, but now it's become more of a, a folklore of ufology yeah. that, 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 that it was intelligent. It was following our plane. Yeah, maybe it's caused by your plane. That's <laughs> <laughs> like that's the thing that they seem to be missing. That yes, it's following your plane because you're making yeah, it. Yeah, you know, So, so like I, I've been concerned because my father uh, is constantly being pursued by farts. <laughs> I, they're following him everywhere, and I don't know. There's no. You can't shake them. Uh, yes, so sir. I, yes. I assume. I assume it's aliens. <laughs> <laughs> Must be this weird alien technology trying to guess us. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but that's basically right. full fighters and they don't I, dwell it that much no they do they, they got some great visuals but it seems like what they're really trying to do is get to this next session section <laughs> where david childress says that what's really going on is that it's a mercury powered uh, anti-gravity device mm -hmm. that is going up they're like they glow this is the nazis the nazis have developed this technology they spin mercury around and then it levitates mm. and then they can guide it to hover around the airplane and, di and disable its systems and i'm like fuck you that's not what it is <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> okay you can go online and see mercury is absolutely uh, can be impact like you can take electromagnetic field to make it spin yeah. around. It's like a metal. It's like a liquid metal, like the T one thousand. Yeah, you know, you can, uh, from Terminator. <laughs> you can make a bunch of nice stuff with mercury, except being poisoned. You get that as a bonus. Yeah, it's but <laughs> it, yeah, but it, it you know its uh, anti gravity properties are you know um, yeah imaginary. <laughs> I think is the right word. So I they, they they he just says it. He just says that's what happens. You spin Mercury around, and it flies. Yeah, you know. but Childress like, has some strange fascination with Mercury because he has brought up this before. So Mercury, you can have found it all over ancient uh, civilization, and they've used it to, I don't know, power electricity and uh, kill people and everything. So it's not weird for Childress to say it. Because he makes up yeah. things about it all the time. Uh, <laughs> oh, did they talk about the the first emperor of China? Yeah, he brought that up in brief, and also yes, the Persian. That's, that's a great story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, I mean, it's I I wonder. I mean, it would be gorgeous if you think about just aesthetically. Mm. If you have a a model of like the Forbidden City, and you put a a river of mercury around it, it would be gorgeous, yeah. right? Yeah, that's what that's what they claim is in that in that pyramid uh, uh, of the first emperor. Uh, they won't let you dig there, but it, but, but I can't, you know, it, it would have looked amazing and it's wonderful folklore. And maybe there really was mercury use. I don't know, but it, it's not magic. It doesn't have any special properties other than it will kill you. Uh, it's like, I mean, you know, I, it's no, and they use this, they, they start to talk about the U boats or uh, submarines, as you call it in Americas, and how we found submarines with uh, mercury outside Norway and I think they say Indonesia. And I was a bit surprised. And I actually went and at least outside Norway, there is a U boat. Apparently, it started to become a quite issue en environmentally since it's leaking mercury mm -hmm. and nuclear material so the plan have they tried spinning it around to see if the u-boat will fly no. <laughs> maybe i should suggest that to the norwegian government to send down a magnet and just try to spin it just spin it around there you go so <laughs> they're so planning to cover it and uh, now with concrete as we did in uh, i think it's uh, chernobyl Yes, <laughs> maybe they should cover it with glass and make the world's largest thermometer. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> no, so there is U-boats with mercury, but the real story behind them is more in interesting than the fake flying saucer version. So apparently Japan bought a lot of mercury from Italy and used Germany as the middleman. Mm. And... Uh, the mercury industrial complex yeah. and yeah. then you might ask well why would japan need some mercury i didn't know it before and you posted a little yeah. link there but apparently at least before you made mercury or you use mercury to use ammunition primers and detonators and you linked uh, what is it lethal weapon 
<laughs> exactly. In Lethal Weapon, there's a scene. That, uh, can you do you ever do editing with clips? You could put that clip. In. It's only like three seconds long, but yeah, I can throw uh, it in. It, <laughs> yeah, it's, I remember the, the, it's, it's Riggs says uh, it's like Mercury, Mercury switches kablooey. It's like you know, it's like it's, it's like this is some serious shit, basically. So yeah, Mercury switches kablooey. That's heavy God. shit. I love that movie. So. <laughs> Oh, it was ages I saw it, but then. But yeah, yeah so th then they go to. I actually did not know this UFO crash. This was a new one for me. Uh, but I, everybody loves to say the Nazis uh, were using UFO technology and and trying to go to the moon. And it's like, oh, there's so much messed up and confused mythology around this. It really is. And some of this I blame on. Do you know? Are you familiar with the book, The Morning of the Magicians? It's come up a couple of times. It's the French before Daniken, right? It yeah. is. It, Von Daniken basically <laughs> is a liqueur. And I think maybe Morning of the Magicians is more of a beer. Yeah. Like it's got, it's, it's, it's not nearly as concentrated uh, with its non, it's got, it's a broad spectrum. It talks about lots of things. It talks about alchemy. It's, it's, but it really is kind of the, um, a lot of times when you're trying to track stuff culturally, mm. you want to try to find out, well, where's case zero? Where does this come from? Morning of the Magicians is kind of the case zero for an, a huge amount of fringe. Uh, information. The authors had just survived World War II, and they were very fascinated by what happened mm. with the Nazis. How how come all these good people could be misguided by one crazy demagogue with some weird ideas? And so they talked about, uh, you know, cults and um, occultism, um, you know, Ariosophy, um, the uh, world ice theory, all these kind yeah. of fringy things that were really popular in uh, the Nazi leadership. There's not much evidence that Hitler himself was like a, an extremely occult person, but he surrounded himself with people who absolutely were mm -hmm. enamored with occult ideas. Um, some of these come from theosophy from a woman named Blavatsky, uh, and she basically did this sort of thing where she collected information from lots of different religions, and uh, she believed in this idea of root races, and of course the this um this idea that like there were all these different races and some of them were closer to the like the pure version than others yeah. and it, that fed right into the sort of need for a, a a teutonic or aryan um you know supremacy this this narrative this myth that you know mm. that we're really important everybody has that like nationalistic kind of our country's great <laughs> go team but then they kind of tied it not just to their geography but also to yeah, race and believed in racial purity and it that's a terribly dangerous mm. combination because if you believe that your country's the best and that no no you genetically are the best you know, why should you worry about anybody else? It takes the empathy away, right? You don't need to. Those are lesser people. We don't need to worry about them. So no, I think it's very dangerous. Yeah, yeah. it's a dangerous thing and something I've noticed that they tend to, they have a bit of racist undertone. You see it not as much in this episode, but for example, here you notice that the Germans would not have succeed uh, with all the technology if they didn't capture this alleged UFO crash in Freiburg means and Nori comes in and say that it was just thanks to American know-how that we beat the Germans in the war. But yeah, I couldn't find anything concrete about the UFO crash in Freiburg. I did. I don't think you're going to. <laughs> no, uh, but I did stumble upon that there were some British boys that got lost pre-World War II. Apparently it was some big thing. Then I stumbled upon someone named... Uh, Jan or Jan van Helsing. Have you come across that before? Um, the only van Helsing I know is from Dracula. So <laughs> Yeah, but it seems as this UFO crash is built upon Jan. Uh, in some places, he's named Jan. I'm not sure which one is correct. Oh, and, and you've got the, and also the Vril Society. Yeah. <laughs> and, the, and the Vril comes from a fictional work by a guy named Edward bulwer Lytton. Yeah. And he, he had a, a book called The Coming Race, which is about uh, like sort of reptile people who live under mm. the earth and have magic energy. That's something we've never heard about <laughs> again. Right, so, but he, his book is fiction and so popular that Blavatsky and her theosophy people believed that he wasn't writing fiction. He was, he was revealing a truth. Like, yeah. yeah, he says it's fiction, but obviously there's really lizard people with magic energy who live in the world. And Vril's amazing, right? 
And, and so that became part this, uh, this search for real energy. It's not that different from zero point energy or all these other mm. ideas that are tied to, to this stuff. <laughs> so yeah, there's definitely a, um, a racist sort of uh, theme. And I kind of have to blame Blavatsky for this, but uh, I don't know that she was particularly malicious. I don't know that she was. She seemed to like really love every culture. Maybe I don't know. She wasn't. I, I think she's a problematic person. She was definitely a trickster. She she definitely manipulated mm. people and used magic, like like card trick type magic, to to fool people. <laughs> um, but but the, the what happened is as people distill her ideas, they become more and more racist, and you know it really does feed into. Again, I don't know necessarily why Hitler was a racist. I think that, that obviously anti-Semitism existed way before yeah. any of this, you know, brill <laughs> stuff. But but uh, yeah, he he used it, I think, to to fuel his people. Like it, it, anything that sort of promoted his agenda was fair mm. game, right? So yeah, yeah, but this Jan Jan van Helsing, uh, apparently his real name is Jan Odo Hawley. Uh, he has is a known anti-Semite to that extent that several of his books are banned in Germany due to uh, Holocaust denial. Wow. So again, it's problematic source they get uh, this Freiburg crash from, to say the least. Hi, I'm just going to chime in here for a quick second. We're talking about the Protocols of Zion, or as it's originally known, the protocols of the sessions of the world alliance of freemasons and the sages of science and it's a quite long known hoax with deeply anti-semitistic roots so it originates somewhere in russia st petersburg 1903 and it's been known quite early that it's a hoax basically but it's it's a nasty hoax that's been lingering for quite some time i will attach to the show notes some more information about these documents but if you hear it in conversation you can be rest assured that these people might not be on the up and up let's get back to it yes absolutely well there is a part of the post World War II Nazi culture, this, this sort of, you might say neo Nazi, that love to, <clears throat> excuse me, they love to use stories of German technological superiority mm. as a way to, you know, um, imply that the, if the racial, like that the racial superiority ideas are also as is valid as the technological yeah. ones. And, and to get people to believe that the, that, that Hitler's still alive, <laughs> that he moved to like Antarctic bases or that he's on the moon. Like there's, it's crazy ideas, but it's all got this Nazi core to it. And it's, it's rotten, you know, and it's like, you can stack all kinds of pretty graphics and other ideas, but if you're, if you're, if you start with a seed of racist Nazi stuff, don't be surprised when the fruit of that is more racist Nazi stuff. That's really kind of where it heads, you know? Well, so. uh, on the account of uh, Nazis on the moon, did you see the Finnish movie, Iron Sky? <laughs> <laughs> I have not watched Iron Sky or the sequel, <laughs> Which, if I remember correctly, is also theosophically tied. I think it's. Um, hold on a second. There, there, I think this is kind of funny. Iron Sky Two, the coming race, yeah. Bulwer Light. It's, yeah, yeah. I thought it, I knew it was tied in there somehow, but no, I haven't watched it. But I do have it, so it's, it's on my to do list. So, um, not out of an exciting sense of to do, more like it's like my duty is. A, I need to know about this stuff because I want to be able to talk about yeah, it. You know, yeah, I saw it on cinema when it came out there, 2012. Oh, yeah. really? Really? On the big on screen? On the big screen or as big as come when it's a Finnish movie. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so wait, wait, how, how did the audience like it? I mean, was it fun? What I remember... It looks pretty wacky. It looks pretty crazy. It's really crazy. And it has this Scandinavian humor, I would describe it, that it's... Extreme, extremely dark, yeah. just like our weather and everything else. <laughs> well, it look, 
I saw that, that Chris, you know, in America, we're, you know, we've made many things that are really, you know, people love, mm. like, um, I think television was really perfected here. Um, you know, the, uh, the motor cars I mean, wasn't invented here, but it was really perfected mm. here. Um, and, and obviously Sharknado. Um, so, uh, you know, things that, you know, have really improved the world. No, I saw that there was a, another one of these type of movies that had Nazis riding sharks in the air, like flying sharks. And it's like, really, really? Okay. So, but it seemed about the same quality here. So yeah. I would say it's better than Sharknado, but it wouldn't have deserved any Oscars at least. Oh yeah. So that's called sky sharks that came out in 2020. <laughs> I assume that's because of the pandemic. I I am not kidding. I'm going to put this in the chat for you. Hold on a second. Uh, how do I do that? Chat, chat, chat. At some time when you have finished everything else in your life that's important, you can take a look at that link. <laughs> I will bookmark it for later then. <laughs> yes, yes. Just You can postpone that as long as you need to. This <laughs> how about we move on to Roswell? Yes, exactly. The alien thing that I think everyone has heard about to some extent. Yeah, that's why it surprised me that they didn't do the Kenneth Arnold story. Mm. Because without Kenneth Arnold, you don't get Roswell. Like, you just don't. Because what what the Kenneth Arnold story did was it got everybody looking for flying saucers. And they believed that they were in the sky. And it creates this big media flap where everybody's reporting flying saucers all of a sudden. And people start faking them, all this sort of thing's happening. And so when Matt Brazel, this this rancher, finds this weird garbage all over his property, mm. uh, he it seems alien to him. So if you imagine, this is kind of like finding mylar, like a mylar balloon, a shiny yeah. silver material. It's very tough. It's flexible. You can wad it up into a ball. It goes flat again. It's like mylar, <laughs> but it's 1947 nobody's seen mylar mm. you know it's it's a very new thing and so um I, I he he doesn't know what to make of this but he knows that everybody's looking for flying saucers and he thinks maybe this is one maybe it crashed yeah. here right but it's just pieces of stick like balsa wood and some tape and this mylar but if you watch this recreation there's smoke <laughs> and wreckage and like and, the, and the, this was actually milder than most of the recreations I see. They usually have big chunks of ship laying there and dead <laughs> aliens and you know, fire and radiation, you know, all kinds of things. No, it was like literally bits of debris is what was really found. But what's happened is since 1947, it the, the military first said it was a flying mm. disc. They released a news story saying it was a flying disc and then really quickly retracted that and said, oh, no, no, no. It's a weather yeah. balloon. And t technically... It was a weather balloon in the sense that that's the same kind of balloon that it was, mm. but it was doing a very special secret project at the time called Project Mogul, where they were taking listening and sensor devices up to high altitudes, looking to see if the Russians or anybody else was doing any kind of bomb yeah. testing. So this was about the Cold War. It's it's the we've only been out of World War II for two years, and we're already like we got to watch those rescues. We got to keep an eye on them. So if you don't keep an eye on them in 1947, the next thing you know, they'll invade Ukraine. So you got to keep an eye on them. So <laughs> oh boy. So <laughs> anyway, the, the, but with the retraction sticks, the, the story goes yeah. away, and so it, it really just disappears until. In was it the seventh? Very late nineteen yeah. seven, like nineteen seventy nine, nineteen eighty. Right there, you start to get a few people. Stanton Freeman, in particular, goes back and starts talking to uh, Jesse Marcel, mm. and uh, th who's the officer who had to do the retraction, and it becomes a story of a cover up. And then as soon as that happens, it just blows up. <laughs> Suddenly, everybody's got their story. And the whole town of Roswell, which is really an important town in rocket history, because that's where Robert Goddard was doing mm. a lot of his research, um, becomes a UFO place. And so uh, I've been to Roswell, and they've got a UFO museum there. It's in an old theater. It's, it's, it's really, they've really leaned into it and started making a good bit of money yeah, only seen uh, the, on, this, on this idea. I've seen yeah. a picture, so it's as crazy as media paints it out to be. It is um, at times, like around the time of the anniversary, 
uh, in the summertime, they have a big festival mm. out there to kind of like commemorate it each year. Um, and they, you know, like you see a lot of, you know, people sell alien, you know, tchotchkes and, you know, this, that, and the other brick brack and garbage. <laughs> I don't know. What do you want to call it? I, it's fun. I mean, my office is full of aliens and monsters and ghosts. So, I mean, I'm, I'm as much of a shopper as anybody else, but, uh, but it, it's, it's, I don't think that, that those, the toys and the museums matter so much as all the stories, the books that have come out of it, um, and the, the documentaries, which, you know, it undermines people's faith in, you know, government honesty mm. and, and, and it undermines people's understanding of how technology works because of stuff like Corso's and Burns book about, you know, the aliens, you know, crashing and we reverse engineered everything yeah. out of that. I'm like, no, 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 no. You know, it's just not how that works. So I find it offensive intellectually. Uh, I do find those stories fun. But I also really hate the way they've corrupted our understanding of history of how we got yeah, here. They so, are, yeah, they are, in a sense, dangerous in that sense that they makes it a bit lazy for us and the viewer yes. too. Why question something when we can just say, oh, it's aliens. It's exactly. you stop looking for the proper answer that, well, in most cases can be even more interesting than an alien did it, in exactly. a sense. And we also have Linda Moulton Howe that they, for some reason, sent out on site. <laughs> <laughs> She's on site, yeah. She's been around forever. Her, she is a TV producer, uh, and you know, she does in a journalist. Mm. And she she became famous for um, doing a story about cattle mutilations in the seventies, or maybe right in nineteen eighty, called "Strange Harvest." Yeah. And she it was it, it won a local Emmy. And ever since then, uh, she has continued to pursue these sort of fringe stories. Well, her, she really got into uh, a broader audience when she became a regular contributor to Art Bell's Coast to Coast AM mm -hmm. show. Uh, and so she would every you know week she would come in with a new story and like she basically would just collect stuff. And she had a regular segment. Uh, other people do that. But now, I mean, like you know, people like Aaron Sagers and other people like would come call in regularly and tell here's what I heard. It's almost like a, a, a rumor hotline, uh, you know, and it's like, but the rumors are all about fringe, you know, government conspiracies and UFOs and aliens and Bigfoot yeah. and that sort of thing. So that she's, she's really leaned into that and that's become her career, but she never fails to mention she has that Emmy. And I, I mean, I wouldn't either probably if I had an Emmy, so I, I don't blame her, but it has been a few minutes since she got that Emmy. Well, so uh, maybe, she's getting yeah. the most of that Emmy. <laughs> She really, really, really is. She were so. on in a previous episode talking about uh, cattle mutilation. Didn't say much, but um, apparently she has contacts everywhere. And I think I didn't understand this Bob Wood thing that she got. Okay, so what that's about is the these. She's tying these to the Majestic Twelve documents. It's I think that I think that particular document is a little bit different. But what it's a it's one tied directly to Roswell. And it implied uh, that there were bodies at the crash. But I have to tell you, if you talk about, um, it's almost like, um, do, do you talk about religion much here? I don't know what your religious background is. I don't want to be no, sensitive no, it, in any way. It's but, fine. We're atheists, uh, um, the whole Swede. And so. Okay, super. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I figured as much, but you, you know, I, again, I, I, I am. I started out as a very religious mm. person, have become an yeah. atheist, and so my family's still very religious. And I'm not afraid to talk about this, but I, just, I like to try to do it in a non-offensive way. That being said, if you look at the history of the Bible, especially like the Gospels, they're written, you know, at eighty to you know 150 mm. years after you know Jesus was said to have walked yeah. the earth. I'm kind of a mythicist. I'm not sure any of that's real, but the the point is all these retellings, there's inconsistencies in all of it. And and what we're seeing here is like the emergence of a mythology about alien crashes. And so all of these documents, people make hoaxes. They're almost like pious hoaxes. And like, it's almost like a, a relic from a saint or something like that, where it's, it's becomes a tangible embodiment of this myth of aliens crashing. And so all these fake documents that somebody might've done for a laugh, yeah. <laughs> have become sacred text to the UFO true believer, right? I mean, they don't probably see it that way, but multiple religious studies people have looked at UFO culture and said, no, no, this is a religion. Like, 
you have to say, well, wait a minute, what's religion? But it, it, it's a thing that's built on faith and practice. Mm. And I'm not, I'm not a religious studies person, but it is absolutely fascinating to me. And if I could live for two or 300 years, I would probably <laughs> take the time to get a religious studies degree as well as many other degrees. Because I, the older I get, the more I realize I, I, I get little bits and pieces, but I really want to know what the hell is going on with our species. Why do we think the way we do? Why do we act the way we do? And these kind of things, we're seeing this emergence of this new hmm. thing. And it's also true for cryptozoology. All the, all the Bigfoot tracks are like <laughs> religious relics. They're all, it's all about this, I believe in a thing. Look, here's the evidence. I believe in that evidence. You know? And so anybody can come and say, but that's not real. We know that the Shroud of Turin is not real. It's a 13th yeah. century hoax. It doesn't stop people from praying at it, to it, for it. You know, it's 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 just we people have faith. Yeah, and to be fair, they even were quite honest about it. So we in a previous episode, Billy Barnes comes in and say, the more you're trying to convince me otherwise, the more I will still continue to believe. Yeah. Yes, he, he most certainly <laughs> will. Yes. <laughs> I think, you know, in his career, like, you know, he runs a UFO magazine and, you know, he, he, these appearances mm. and stuff, he writes books about this. I, I, you know, I think if your income is derived from your faith, that really helps you double down because your house payments <laughs> now dependent on this being true or if not true, at least plausible. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a bit of a motivator to continue, even if you would know otherwise. But I, I was under the impression that how is it pronounced? Majestic, Mayik? Majestic, yeah. majestic, yeah, majestic. Twelve, yeah, MJ, MJ twelve is probably fine. That's that's what most people say. Yeah, but they, that they originated with Jamie Shandera or Bill Moore or something like that. So I don't, you know, I'm not. Uh, I don't have that to to memory. I know that the majestic documents are a hoax. Yeah, there's been pl there's been plenty <laughs> of. There's basically there's some problems with the. Um, the, the type, like the typewriter mm. that was used. There, there's some, there, it's, it's interesting. People are experts on lots of things. If you're going to do a hoax, it's really hard. Like, it's like, it's like if you're going to recreate a, an ancient text, you know, you need the right age mm. paper and the right kind of ink. You can make it look and fool an average person, but real experts can like really dig in on this stuff. And so, um, I think Stanton Freeman, uh, they tried to fool him. I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, he actually realized it was a hoax, but lots of other people didn't. And so the, whoever was creating these documents tried to sh sort of shop it around uh, by sending out like, you know, film of it, right? Basically, so that you could blow up the film and say, oh, look at yeah. this. Doc you don't get the documents, <laughs> you get a photograph of the documents, and then those get reproduced. I, so I don't have time for a like, huge ang, though, but I, I remember like one time I went to a, in the 1990s, mm. I went to a copy center to get some photocopies because it used to be really expensive to get copies. You had to like go to a, a, a building where they had copy machines. And uh, I went in to copy some character sheets for my game, a role-playing game, because I'm a nerd. Um, and while I was there, the people behind the counter were like, should we show him? Yeah, I think he looks cool. We should show him. And they like they slid this thing across the counter to me. And it was a big stack of government documents. They're like, you wouldn't believe this. You just missed it. This guy came yeah. in and he wanted us to photocopy these government documents. And look at this stuff. It's all about aliens. And so they gave me a copy as well. They were making copies for themselves. It's like whatever the guy came in for, he came in for his set of documents. And basically I got a copy of this kind yeah. of thing. And it was just all <laughs> photocopies of these weird government documents about alien species and what's really going on. And it's like, it's very seductive to be exposed to what you believe is secret government information. It's like, I was, you know, in my early twenties, like, oh my God, this is amazing. You know, <laughs> so, now I'm a lot, it's a lot harder to get me excited about this stuff, but you know, uh, it, it is still interesting. Yeah, there's so much fakes out there. There are. But they bring up the Phoenix Light. I don't find mm -hmm. those as interesting and neither did the show really <laughs> either. <laughs> no, you know, they were very interesting in the nineties. Um, in 1997 was a, a, very, a special year for me because that was the year the Phoenix Lights yeah. happened. It was also ye the year that the um, uh, Shoemaker Levy comp. No, yeah, Shoemaker Levy. Yes, Shoemaker Levy uh, came over. I, I get that one confused with the Hale Bob. Nope, it was Hale Bob. Shoemaker Levy is the one that crashed into yeah. Jupiter and left. It was huge, spectacular nuclear explosions <laughs> all over Jupiter when the, these giant 
rocks hit the the big red the big eye and or they hit the they hit jupiter our biggest planet and it was spectacular but um hail bop came in and it was um it was a it was the first comet i was ever able to like mm. look up in the sky and see it was just there all the time it was just hanging in the air just <laughs> like in those medieval documents where they show you a star hanging in the sky you're like look at that it's it's so peculiar because the tail may not be it may be going in weird directions from where you would expect it to be. It's so neat. Um, but it's not like a meteorite where it zips across the sky. It just hangs there. It's going really fast, but you can't tell. Anyway, that same year, that was when the uh, uh, Heaven's Gate cult killed itself, or the, the members killed themselves, but, and that was kind of tied to that incident. And so I started thinking, wait a minute. Those cultists, they believed in UFOs and science fiction. They were web developers. <laughs> But they also killed themselves. Like, but how are they different from me? Why did they believe the UFO stuff's real and die? Mm-hmm. And I see the same information and don't, and I'm still alive. Like, why, why, how are these people who are so, it really broke my heart. Yeah. And so I decided to really start investigating this stuff more seriously because of that. So I went on a UFO road trip. I went to uh, a lot of different places around like Gulf Breeze, Florida. And, and one of the places I went was Roswell, New Mexico. And one of the places I went was Phoenix. And so um, at the time, it was really kind of an interesting mystery, but it turned out what was going on was the airplane was flying over for military exercises. They were dropping yeah. flares. As they're traveling in a line, dropping the flares, it creates this illusion of a giant. If we see three dots in the air, <laughs> unless they're in a perfect line, we've just seen a triangle flying, right? I mean, that's what it, it's really not that hard to make a flying yeah. triangle. We, we see the lights and we fill in the craft. Our brain just does that. We, if I see lights in a triangle and they're in the sky, that's got to be a flying triangle, except that it doesn't. <laughs> but it's a really, it, it's a very compelling illusion. Uh, and so you can actually watch them dropping behind the mm. mountain range and like, and see them just, it, it's a perfectly good explanation. Um, so we know what that is. It's not a mystery, but it will always be part of folklore because nobody in ufology lets a mystery go. No, you so. can't disprove them in that sense can move on to nick pulp hi it's just me again i'm going to chime in here a little bit again we did actually meet nick pulp only for a brief second though in episode three of the show or episode two of ancient aliens the visitors but again it was just in for a quick moment let's get back to the show he was a new character for me. Oh, yeah. oh really? He okay. has not been... He's, he's UFO classic. He's, he's, you he's, have come yeah. to understand that now. And well, if you don't know, he was part of um, the UK government to some extent. Mm, ministry, yeah. ministry of Defense. And he had yeah, yeah. Uh, the alien desk, I think, for some time investigating reports from UFO uh, and things alike. But he comes off up and basically, yeah, he talks about the Suffol UFO. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know much about that one. Now I do know Rind- Rindlesham Forest. I do know that. Yeah, story. but that's basically um, the same. But for some reason, they use uh, yeah. the town Suffolk instead of the yeah. forest name. But yeah, they bring up that is uh, high radiation in the area and. Apparently, you can go and look at it. It was American forces, and there was a colonel, 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 colonel. colonel. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't. It doesn't look like colonel. <laughs> uh, colonel Holt. Uh, apparently, he saw these lights in the sky, and the story has evolved since the nineteen eighty. It yeah. has evolved. Yes. So yes. Uh, now I think some say they even saw the UFO land, but. Apparently, Halt <laughs> went with a Geiger counter, yeah. and apparently he didn't know how to operate it. You can still hear his recordings of the investigation, but he talks about always oh, up seven tenth, uh, let's say seven units of the five point scale. which would roughly translate to uh, 0.07 uh, millirentekens per hour. So 
normal background radiation but again someone who yeah they don't say that right <laughs> they, they imply that there's like you know the ground's glowing yeah. or something you know like it's like really dangerous radiation it's not and it's I not that but that's a it's definitely a story that's been blown up over time where and and the people who were the original witnesses at least one of them has gone down the uh path of expanding on his story over the years quite a bit <laughs> for, for, like the others like they saw a thing they came back and saw a thing yeah. later you know uh but the other guy's like no no it, it communicated with me i saw writing <laughs> i received numbers from it mentally they it communicated to me in binary and it's like what you know, no no it didn't anyway that there, it is an interesting story but i find it mostly interesting because of the way the story's evolved and grown over time exactly like yeah. roswell because we're myth building that's exactly what's happening it's myth building and so it, it's just going to keep growing. That's you know. that's part of human nature to some sense. And I think mm -hmm. you might be more familiar with this. People using tools that they don't obviously know how to operate in their investigations. Yes. Yes. Yeah. This happens in ghost hunting a lot where people use electromagnetic <laughs> equipment uh, and don't understand things like, I'm using an EMF <laughs> meter and I'm also carrying a mobile phone. Like, no, nothing could possibly be, you know, you know, so uh, that, that, yeah, no, no, no. No, no you have no, a bunch no, of no, no. <laughs> <laughs> electrical things on you and then, oh, in this uh, house without any powers from 1920. It's got weird, freak exactly, exactly. <laughs> Wait, my phone exactly. is ringing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like, what a coincidence. So, yeah, no, it's just terrible. And, and Nick Pope is a good communicator. And, you know, he had that job for more than mm. 20 years. And, and it doesn't, you know, I think when he presents himself in that role, it, sometimes it sounds like he was, you know, like Project Blue Book out investigating. But I think the real thing that office, a couple of things about that. One, he's a second generation person in the Ministry mm. of Defense. His father was also in the, in the so it's like a family legacy, you know. Uh, I I just don't know how important that office was in protecting Great Britain from aliens. <laughs> Since uh, it seems much, it seems more like he had a cushy and interesting government job. If, if you know what I mean, like it's just it. I, I don't think you know. It's not like uh, you know he was out like mm. taking samples no. and all that. It, it's not that. It's whatever this was. It's it's not what it seems like it is. So he's not Mulder, although that's constantly how it's described. And his wife looks suspiciously like Dana <laughs> Scully. So I think in a lot of sense he's doing a little bit of cosplay yeah, but there. But from that's, the way he talked, at least in this episode, I also noticed that he had a new uh, show with. Uh, on YouTube, I think now even. But the way he talked, uh, he wanted to be Mulder from X Files. Yes, and he seems a bit upset so. that they uh, they stopped his office after what did they say, fifty years? They had this UFO well, disc was, or something. Yeah, it, it, it was a yeah. while. Yeah, yeah. I know he he ran it for a little bit more than twenty years. So, but then so they, I can't even imagine doing the same thing for twenty <laughs> years. So, well. Uh, Except my wife. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, so but so Riddlesome Forest, I think, is a non-starter if you really dig into it. But but fortunately, they didn't. They basically just mentioned it and moved on to the next thing because that's what yeah, they do. They, it's quick cuts all the time. Otherwise, they lose attention. I think because <laughs> ah, maybe that's it. Yeah. It's hard to keep a stoner engaged. Yeah. Right? <laughs> you need to be uh, quick cuts and make them uh, have the wall moments often, maybe. And and break breaks for <laughs> snacks because we need some snacks. But so. we move from these to exopolitics, which I yeah. So they they start out with Stephen Greer, uh, who is um, a guy whose business is all about disclosure. Mm. And uh, when, when I think about people who've really tried to sort of turn ufology into a religion, uh, the faith, he has this idea that the governments know about all this stuff, that they're hiding mm. it, but that they're planning at some point to release the information to everyone so we can all know. Um, and that's called disclosure. And it's... Um, like Jesus coming back, it's never going to happen. Okay, sorry, like, it's been two thousand years. He's late. Okay, so uh, the, the, man, that sounds really harsh. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> but disclosure is um, 
uh, one of those uh, the, what's, the, what's there's a technical term for yeah. bullshit <laughs> um it's it's not it's not a thing that's going to happen he's been ranting about it for years every time there's a story involving a government and a mm. ufo all the disclosure people get very very excited you know, it's the, but it's, it's like an apocalyptic type thing. It's like the, ah, here's the thing we're all waiting for, and the, you know? And so he's, it's, you know, there's this idea of like when prophecy yeah. fails, uh, it's this idea, you know, it's, it's, it, they never stop believing that there's going to come that day. And every time there's an alien hmm. movie, it's believed that that's not an entertainment industry trying to make 300 to a billion dollars <laughs> on a movie. That's the government's preparing us for the inevitable, you know, aliens who are coming. Now, why some of the aliens are good and some of the aliens are trying to destroy us, uh, you know, I don't know what their messaging is. They seem to be all over the place about what the aliens are up yeah. to. I mean, from the, they created us <laughs> first and then we were maybe slaves and then we were something else and then they help us build pyramids and uh, electricity, but never anything useful like i don't know germ theory i think most of the yeah, world right. <laughs> has been a lot more grateful for germ theory than how to staple rocks in a neat shape <laughs> well yeah you know like if you own cows or you own livestock you treat that livestock to keep it yeah. alive right i mean you 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 feed it you <laughs> give it medicine it may not have the best life in the world but you do not want it to die you want it to fulfill its purpose so I don't know. There's, I've seen no evidence that anybody's doing any care and maintenance on our species. Anybody except ourselves. No. So, and barely <laughs> us. <laughs> like, we might even refuse to maintain so, ourselves. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. There's, there's one point in here where they talk about the aliens are going to wipe us out and they're going to use a virus. And I'm like, aha, suckers, they failed. <laughs> Several <laughs> times because uh, previously they brought up the plague as an um, alien virus. Exactly. <laughs> So, you know, about every hundred years we get a pandemic, you yeah. know, so fortunately we got another hundred years where we need to worry about that again. So Yeah, <laughs> and I like the idea that the UN was founded just to speak with aliens. They yeah. get lonely. <laughs> so it's just like, <laughs> well, you know, this, again, this is, uh, they talk about this in Morning of the Magicians, this idea that, you know, that the, the aliens uh, created us or accidentally create us and then they go back to the works of hp lovecraft and say you know maybe hp lovecraft wasn't a fiction writer you know maybe maybe he was revealing something mm. to us just like bulwer lighten and the vril it's the same thing they take a fiction thing and they go that's so cool wouldn't it be cool if it was yeah. real which it, of course and then it's just a small hop from there to it's real but they're hiding it from us you know so the, 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 oh, the interplay between fiction fact myth and fantasy and reality is so fascinating to me but you have to have some system to filter out what's legitimately something i should mm. believe and what's not and that's a skill and a technology the, the, those <laughs> rational skills for evaluating things you have to learn them they're not they're not no. natural you know that and, and if you don't learn them you i don't know <laughs> Use your gut, and, and, and clearly, thirty percent of us apparently are living by our guts, and I don't think it's healthy when the you know when you have to this clash between people who basically have a different mode mm. for interpreting what's real and what's not. You know, it that's again a, kind of a religious struggle. I believe that, you know you can have a, an understanding of reality and that there is a material world, and a lot of them think this is just a thing we have to endure before we get to the real world, which is all spiritual and magic and singing yeah. and happiness. So. And, and aliens. aliens. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> oh, exobiology and exopolitics. Uh, they talk about the UN being created to negotiate with the yeah, extraterrestrials. With the <laughs> it's like, it's like, and why? Sorry, I live near an no. airport. So. <laughs> and we have some... Um, People from the Vatican talking a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And they have the conflict between Greer. Stephen mm. Greer thinks that religions will collapse. Civilization will collapse. Governments collapse. And the Catholic Church is like, meh, meh, aliens are fine. Yeah. We don't care. Yeah, and more you know, people to if God, ma God made us. God made <laughs> aliens. You know, there is that interesting question, though. If, if the, first you have to believe there's mm. a soul, that that's a thing that intelligent creatures have is like this 
spiritual soul. And then you have to believe that other creatures that are intelligent out there would also have a soul. And then you also have to believe that we fell. We fell in Eden. Mm. We fell. We didn't meet God's standards and we, we sinned. But do we actually know that the aliens have fallen? Did they mm. sin? Like maybe maybe they're still living in a pure maybe. state. I don't know. Could you, be. You know, but it doesn't <laughs> matter because like they're like, well, what, can aliens be saved by Jesus? Are aliens even, are the aliens going to show up and like some people are going to be like, okay, welcome. Okay, we didn't believe in you, but the, here you are. But I think the first thing you need to know is you're a terrible <laughs> sinner, and I need to introduce you to this two thousand year old dead guy who's going to forgive you for your badness. But you know, it's like. Stop! You know, that doesn't make any sense. Or it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, so, I also found it a bit amusing know. that Greer, well, it will collapse and the uh, Christians basically, oh, more people to save. And it leans back to, because in Catholic faith previously, they have a lot of weird discussion about who to save and who to not. And back in the um, medieval times, it was common for them to have discussions. So there was a belief that somewhere there were uh, people with dog heads living sinus of yeah. yep. and yep. the church uh, uh, talked are those type of peoples worth saving do they have a soul and from it seems like yeah they can be saved and same with aliens basically but yeah we then have Giorgio trying to tie up the bag saying it was clear that the uh, aliens uh, did mix with our DNA and brought us all the technology and they tied to tie up the seasons it, it's it's i noticed he had the uh sequoia bird on his uh, lapel the little yeah uh, it was part of the first episode the uh, glide flag the yeah. flyer from egypt yeah that's <laughs> they love that stuff it's, you know these things could really fly if you make the following modifications right <laughs> it's like and also build it out yeah. of foam and also you know it's like you just keep going on with all the things you have to change uh, basically it completely works it's like stone soup i don't know if you know that story about like you know, if you know this, the guy who's hungry. You can look it up. It's a great piece of little folklore about the stone soup. It's a how did a guy who's hungry all he has is a rock, and he like tells this lady yeah. he wants to make soup, and she's like boiling the rock. But it's like you know what's really good with stone soup is you get onions, <laughs> and like you know, you know, and that's pretty. Oh, this is great. Uh, do you have any salt? You know, because yeah. I mean, just uh, do you have any potatoes? Do you have any tomatoes? Do you have any cabbage? You know, by the time he gets done, this is a fully you know, it's not stone soup anymore. <laughs> But it's delicious. It's like the same thing. I think that's what's happening. Yeah, we have a similar story, but with a button. Oh, really? So instead of the soup nice. uh, stone, they make the soup of the button on your shirt. And then, you know, fill in with all the other stuff that they could find. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, it's, a, it's a very, it's a good story because it's funny, but it's yeah. also true. You know, it, it has a powerful <laughs> lesson in it. So, yeah. Oh, and Graham Hancock shows up several times in this episode, which I thought was really funny to me because, you know, his books are largely about the idea that there was a civilization that lived about 10,000 mm. years ago and was lost. And then eventually that collapsed civilization led to every major uh, civilization that we know yeah. about, right? So uh, he he defends himself. If someone calls him an ancient alien theorist, he gets mad and says, that's not what my books are about, which is true. His books don't really talk about ancient aliens for the most part. But here he is on the show talking about ancient yeah. aliens. So if I ever get to talk to him, I'm going to have to say <laughs> bullshit because he's clearly supporting the ideas right here, even if it's not in his yeah, books. He, you know? um, he has been part of the season a lot. And yeah, he's yeah. clearly on the ancient alien he maybe not say it that he it's aliens but how would they these primitive people as he liked to call it uh, have yeah. made such a huge fantastic structures and then he leaves it on a cliffhanger for you to fill in the alien part right and it could be you you would be in this show you would fill yeah. in aliens if you read his books you would fill in maybe something like atlanteans right you know so it could be terrestrial but it's some superior mm. version of, of culture that's been lost to us, you know? So, uh, and even though that's more biologically plausible, also bullshit. <laughs> so, <laughs> And yeah, that basically ends the episode. We have what I like to call him French Lex Luthor. Uh, yeah. <laughs> to close out Robert Bouval, um, 
is his name famous for the Orion constellation theory? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, 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 they're in a line in the belt of Orion, but not a perfect line. And the offset is supposed to match the pyramids. And Giza, uh, the they, Street of the Dead in uh, Mexico, Tinochet oh, really? there, and other places. Is it three in a row? He will claim it's part of the Ryan's belt. <laughs> there you go. So it, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah. It won't, it won't hold up Orion's uh, pants <laughs> and it won't, <laughs> it won't hold up this theory. Yeah, that so, theory yeah. is quite ludicrous on itself. He spent parts of a previous episode here talking about it. And in that episode, they show you how the lines cross all of these ancient sites and I went to Google Map and mapped it out and nothing matched yeah. any longer. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Well, that sounds like, do they talk about ley lines at all? Not here. Sounds like uh, I haven't be. counted ley okay. lines because when I was out on real archaeological digs, we tend to have those dowsers go around yes, and walk around yes. in our yeah, yeah, yeah. fields and we used to put out one by one meter squares. And they are in these squares and say, oh, this is ancient lines here. <laughs> I can feel something is in here. So, yeah, I'm familiar with ley lines, but not from this season, at least. Yeah, th- it it seems to be one of those ideas that won't <laughs> go away. And, uh, and as like dowsing and other things. So, yeah, it's like dowsing's fun. We talked about it in, in research of the, they had a whole episode on in search of yeah. on, on dowsing. And it's like, there's water under the ground most everywhere. So if... If you walk around with a stick uh, and say there's water there, there is. You just have to dig for it. Yeah. So some places it's closer to the surface than others, but dowsing's not dowsing's not real. But it's almost impossible to convince someone if they've if they've ever had that experience yeah. of dowsing successfully. It's almost impossible to convince them that that's just your brain tricking you. You know, it's like a Ouija board or whatever oh, else. But so have this anyway on dowsing. What's the magician? Oh, I feel bad for this now. Uri no, Geller. Um, Uri Geller's worst enemy. Yeah, oh, James Randy. Randy. Yeah, the, the, he was yeah, a yeah, lot the amazing Randy. with dowsing. He wasn't even allowed near when they did dowsing tests, as I remember. <laughs> yeah, he he he, he yeah. really was great. I, I met him several times. We, we, he was on the show a few times, and oh. we, we've met at conferences and stuff. So he he was he loved debunking yeah. nonsense so much he really did but he also loved performing so <laughs> if you went to if you see him like yes you would get great stories and like understandings of how he would like prove things yeah. were fake but also he would like turn a napkin into a thing and like make <laughs> coins disappear it was like it was he's such such a fun guy so um well i wanted to say though that the, the whole episode and i've watched a few of these but probably not as many mm. as you have nor as many as you're destined to uh <laughs> But this reminds me of in in the old struggles between um, creationists and young Earth creationists and uh, mm. you know Darwinian yeah. evolution uh, people. Uh, there's this guy named uh, I think his name was Dwayne Gish, and he used to do a thing called the Gish Gallop, and he basically would be in a debate, and he would just say so many wrong things so fast it was almost impossible to refute them because. It was just hmm. boom, bada boom, bada boom, bada boom. And so that's how these episodes are. It's just one <laughs> wrong thing, wrong thing, wrong thing, wrong thing. It's like, you don't even have time to process. It. You're just overwhelmed with the nonsense and it's shiny, pretty yeah. nonsense. And so it's like, I think maybe that's the harm in this, you know, and sure. I most, I bet most people just watch it for fun. <laughs> like, I can't believe they think that, you know, no, but, but after about six beers, wait <laughs> a minute. It started to make sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there might be something to this. So. And unfortunately, the recording cuts off here. We had some technical issues, so the last four minutes were lost on Blake's end. But don't worry, I will wrap it up here for you instead. If you want to hear more from Blake, you should head over to monstertalk.org, where you can find his show, of course, named Monster Talk, the science show about monster that he hosts with his co-host, Dr. Karen Stolsnow. You should also head over to patreon.com slash in research of to listen to his other show in research of that he hosts with archaeologist and author Jeb Carr. And the Patreon feed is open for everyone, so you don't need to be a patron to listen in there. So you should head over. 
You will find links to all of this, of course, attached to the show notes if you want to go and look this up later on. And you should, definitely, if you haven't already. And again, a big thank you to Blake Smith who took the time to indulge us with all these stories and all this fantastic information. It's been an info-packed episode, to say the least, and links to his shows will be found in the show notes attached to this episode and remember that you will be able to find reference and further reading suggestions at the same place and remember to leave a positive review anywhere you can such as itunes spotify or maybe to your friend at the trench i would also recommend you to visit diggingupancientaliens.com to find some more info about me and the podcast you can also find me on most social media sites and if you have comments corrections and or suggestions or you basically just want to write an email in all caps, you can also find my contact info at the website. Until next time, keep shoveling that science. lost the chat there's no chat why is there no chat oh it's over here is it it's a it's it's a tab okay there it is sorry i was looking for it on the bottom yeah